The other day, the state of Connecticut ratified the so-called uh, Equal Rights Amendment, uh, bringing at that point the total to 28 states out of the 38 required to graft the amendment onto the Constitution. Uh, the count would have risen to 29, <clears throat> except that on the same day, the state of Nebraska voted to rescind its previous approval of ERA, as the Women's Right Amendment is usually referred to, uh, and therein hangs a, a tale. The legislature in Nebraska was not reacting to opposition to ERA mobilized by sexist males, but by women, many of whom on second blush are discovering in the amendment implications they regard as inimical to the best interests of American women. The national chairman of the movement to stop ERA is Mrs. Phyllis Schlafly, who is here today and raring to go. Mrs. Schlafly is a graduate of Washington University in St. Louis with a graduate degree from Radcliffe. She is the mother of six children and author of several books, a former vice president of the National Federation of Republican Women, and a national chairman of the United States Bicentennial Committee. Dr. Ann Scott is vice president for legislation for the National Organization of Women, which is ordinarily committed to ERA. Mrs. Scott is a writer who took a doctorate at the University of Seattle studying Shakespeare. She was a consultant in 1971 to the Secretary of Labor on Women's Affairs and has acted as a voluntary lobbyist for all legislation dealing with women's rights. With the National Organization for Women, we're an organization of men and women dedicated to bringing women into the mainstream of American life. We do I not stand discriminate correctly. on the basis of sex. Thank you. The proposed, uh, the proposed constitutional amendment passed overwhelmingly by the Senate and the House uh, holds that, quote, equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex. That doesn't sound particularly subversive, and I would therefore like to begin by asking Mrs. Schlafly to state her principal objection to ERA. Well, it's the very innocuous wording of the amendment that is the reason why many people didn't realize in the beginning what unfortunate consequences it would have. But fortunately, the amending process calls for a full-blown debate in the state legislatures around the country, and this is where we find out some of the things that were not originally realized by many people who voted for it. Uh, we find, as we look into the matter, that ERA won't give women anything which they haven't already got or have a way of getting. But on the other hand, it will take away from women some of the most important rights and benefits and exemptions we now have. What would be an example of that? Well, a great glaring example on which there's full agreement between both the proponents and the opponents is the matter of the draft. Women are exempt from the draft. Selective service says only young men of age 18 have to register. But the Equal Rights Amendment will positively make women subject to the draft and on an equal basis with men. Uh, nor could you have a system whereby the women would get all the nice, easy desk jobs and the men get all the fighting jobs. It would have to be equal across the board, uh, in combat, on warships, and all up and down the line. Do you agree with that, Dr. Scott? Uh, there is no question that if the Equal Rights Amendment is passed, that women would become subject to the draft. However, I think that uh, we have a situation now where the draft is going by the boards. And furthermore, I think the question is not one of the rights of women here, but it is the question of the draft. Clearly, no sane parent would want to see either child, either a son or a daughter, subject to the draft. But if women are to be citizens and citizens are to be subject to the draft, then women should take the responsibilities as well as the rights of citizenship. But it's not simply a question of being subject to the draft. It is also a question of denial of opportunity. There are many situations in which women could benefit from the draft. They already are you in might, the service. You might become a war hero. Why not? Yeah. A woman did win the Congressional Medal of Honor. The second winner of the Congressional Medal of Honor in the United States was a, was a woman, Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell. Yes. Interesting. Now, as, as many of you know, uh, Phyllis Shafley is no feminist. A simple Google search will reveal her Stop the ERA campaign, which was highly successful in mobilizing conservative forces to stop the Equal Rights Amendment. And uh, her efforts, they span the time the Equal Rights Amendment was sent to the states for ratification, 
all the way up until 1982 when the amendment fell three states short of the 38 state requisite for amending the United States Constitution. Now, the text of the amendment, and uh, you heard the quote, but I'll read the exact proposed text of the Equal Rights Amendment uh, to you just for accuracy here. Particularly, I'll read section one, which states, quote, Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex, end quote. Now, in reading that statement, it becomes apparent that no men's rights activist can possibly disagree or disavow this simple statement. In fact, it's unequivocally what the men's rights activists should strive for. And I'm supremely confident in saying that anybody that wishes to not have an amendment such as this in the United States Constitution would then be running counterintuitive to the claim goals of men's rights activism. You simply cannot mount a reasonable defense against putting this language in the constitution of any free nation and also maintain your bona fide MRA status in doing so because remember that men's rights activism is about equality under the law between the sexes. You either are for equality under the law between the sexes or you aren't. There cannot be an in-between. No ambiguities can be made. The language is simple, concise, and clear. So I want you then to imagine the ramifications of this kind of language being inserted into the highest legal document in the free world, the United States Constitution. Imagine the ramifications of that. Put aside the fact that feminists wanted this amendment in place for their own selfish reasons and ask yourself what is the potential for an organized MRA political sphere to point at the new language in the United States Constitution and say that, you know, for example, studies show that men face more jail time on average for committing the same crimes as women, or, or imagine the original offending issue. Congress cannot, under the Equal Rights Amendment, demand that men are legally forced to sign selective service documents for their right to vote when women don't have to either. The language, again, is clear. No discrimination based on sex. That's what the MRA wants, correct? Now, I shouldn't have to tell you that for, for the MRAs, it would be immensely conducive to their political needs to have the Constitution specifically state that it cannot discriminate against sex, even if previous amendments already bar discrimination based on race, and even if we argue that these previous amendments are already sufficient, cold hard language inscribed into the Constitution prohibiting sex-based discrimination would be a powerful tool against the propensity for feminists to implement their particularly cherry-picked brand of gender equality. And yet, when push came to shove, the striking down of this amendment came not from feminist interests, but from the conservative traditionalist right. I mean, I mean, this interview in particular is remarkable in that, although the feminist debater is, of course, full of bluster and political posturing, I mean, we know feminists don't really actually want to see women have to earn their equality in the front lines any more than traditionalist white knights do. You know, feminism is, after all, uh, female advocacy at all costs. But as far as this feminist goes, the argumentation she expressed uh, is what sounds to me like the ideal men's rights platform in regards to the issue at hand. That is, according to her words, and I'm quoting here, uh, well, probably paraphrasing you can call it, but uh, I think I'll get the gist here. She says, the draft is an inherently oppressive institution that should be done away with, but if we are to have it and women want equal rights, then they should be expected to sign up for selective service just like men do. Either do away with selective service or implement equal treatment regardless of gender under the law. Now I know I'm repeating this a lot, but to reiterate, any question of men's rights can, to essentially a scientific exactitude, be answered by the question, is it against equality under the law between the sexes or is it for equality? under the law between the sexes. This feminist woman, although I don't believe it to be altruistic for a second, phrased her wording exactly along the lines of equality under the law, while Phyllis Shafley was quoted as saying, quote, that the Equal Rights Amendment won't actually give women anything they don't already have, but will in fact take some of the important rights, benefits, and exemptions that women have had historically, particularly I refer to the draft, end quote. Notice that she said rights then benefits, then exemptions for being a woman. Now, speaking about cherry-picked equality, uh, we've been led to believe in the men's movement by traditionalist conservatives that the right doesn't look at gender, that they teach that everybody is an individual under the law, that identity politics is a bastion and signature of the left. Why then has it reared its ugly head in the trad con right for everyone to see once the chance of real equality enshrined into the Constitution makes itself available? Now let's talk about non-feminism. This, this purveyor of feminism is the great evil and justice of our time mentality. What says the non-feminist here? I mean, have you looked up from your gnashing of teeth at your golden sinian shrine of anti-feminism? Have you looked up yet to notice that while you were indulging in your 10 minutes hate of feminism over and over again, a woman called Phyllis Shafley 
about as non-feminist as they come, mobilized a political reckoning that stopped an amendment to the United States Constitution barring discrimination based on sex. Would you care to explain to me just how the feminists are responsible and to blame for this one? Again, to reiterate, the reason feminists and the National Organization of Women wanted an equal rights amendment to the Constitution was obviously not for the purposes of a true equality between men and women, and certainly not in hopes of furthering any MRA's agenda. But even a first-year law student would be able to tell you that the specificity of the amendment barring discrimination against not men and not women, but on the specific word of sex, would provide a huge opportunity for MRA interests regardless of what the original intent was. We've seen legal precedents used over and over in ways that they were not intended to be, based on some, you know, malleable language uh, in some law. Uh, this this happens over and over again, and it's happened consistently not only in, 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 in lesser courts, but in the Supreme Court. The traditionalist shibboleth of protecting women from harm at all costs is responsible for the failure of the Equal Rights Amendment and all of the ensuing opportunities that men will have missed out on henceforth. This should exist as a lesson to us that it's not just feminists who want a special kind of equality when it comes to women, that for all of their talk about libertarian values and for all of their sanctimonious flag-worshipping liberty and freedom for all bullshit, they, meaning traditionalists, are still just as guilty of a desire to have institutionalized privileges for women, they justify it by selling men a plate of pig slop dripping with chivalry and outdated tradition. They cover it up in euphemisms and homemaking and family values. But in the end, telling men that you should face the possibility of getting shot at more than a woman for the same amount of freedoms is no better and certainly not one iota above the typical feminist brand of jurisprudence that has led us to affirmative action for women or any other one of the injustices leveled against men under the operating assumption that women should be entitled to extra protections or exemptions simply for being female. Instances like this show us in stark clarity that the white feather campaigns of World War II never did end, and when it comes to liberty and patriotism and good old-fashioned American wholesomeness that people proffer as an antidote to feminism, all of us are indeed equal so long as you understand that some women are more equal than others. Now, I might not be an MRA, but I think it's about time that men's rights activists understand that they have a philosophical obligation to decry the blatantly gynocentric inconsistencies wrapped up in traditionalist doctrines, at least when it comes to the main issue at hand here, which to the MRA is again, of course, equality between the sexes under the law. If it isn't okay when feminists do it, it shouldn't be any different when traditionalists do it. If these people really had some genuine interest in keeping women out of combat for practical reasons and the safety of male soldiers, then they can simply petition for the end of selective service for both genders instead of seeking to uphold and exempt for men and women respectively. Juxtapositions and clashes of the two great manifestations of Western gynocentrism, these being traditionalism and feminism, are excellent case studies for us to observe and really get down to the bottom of why and how misandry and male disposability are allowed to persist in our society. In many ways, uh, clashes between the two great gynocentrisms of Western civilizations are are, are nothing more than competitive posturing for who will receive the most male utility and rest assured that no matter who wins, men will have had no say in the matter either way. These ideologies must not be allowed to pass on to the upcoming generations of men and boys. And through, you know, things like hypergamy theory, through an existentialist epistemological breakdown of what it means to be male, through knowledge of ourselves, we can curb the passage of both these insidious ideologies before they infect another generation of men and boys. And I, for one, must at least make the attempt, especially for the younger men and boys out there that grew up seeing pro-feminist self-castigation or pro-traditionalist disposability doctrines as the only two options available to them. No more. Let traditionalism die with the traditionalists that let feminism unfold under their watch, by the way. Let the intrinsic curiosity of the youth point out that if their good old days were so golden and so pure, then why, pray tell, did feminism come about in the first place? Let old men ramble on about America and the family unit and so on and so forth, but let the youth strike out and discover something new for themselves. Now, don't get me wrong, many of the MRAs and MGTOW of the older generations understand what we're attempting to do here and, and fully support us men going their own way, but in the end, it's what we instill in the youth that will either rectify or perpetuate misandry, period, point blank. I mean, we're operating now under what has worked as a guide for what may or may not work in the future. And the fact is that traditionalism relented under the pressure of feminism and has been fighting a losing culture war with it ever since. So it's with that said that I will attempt in this video to identify just what it is we have to do to move forward on the men's rights front and on the cultural front. Particularly, what do we have to start teaching boys so that they don't grow up to be blue pill white knights or male feminists? 
uh, my suggestions, and that's all they are, suggestions, will revolve around an understanding of and dismantling of the accompanying shibboleths of what I've referred to as the two great gynocentrisms of our time, traditionalism and feminism, and, and as well as a fuller understanding of what it actually means to be male. So we're going to examine these shibboleths accordingly and try to discredit them for the purposes of allowing men and specifically boys to develop alternate modes of thought and specifically non-gynocentric modes of thought that contribute to male financial and emotional wealth and freedom, uh, what I've referred to previously as male sovereignty. Now, the shibboleths I've mentioned generally have their basis in